So, I had been getting into multiple altercations lately with a person who had been a thorn in my side on Facebook. Goes by the name of Cody Ranting. And uh, he always seemed to have a problem with me, but never seemed to be able to articulate what his problem with me is, other than I too mean. So, I kept on telling him that, telling him that he wasn't disproving anything I was saying, telling him that he was being illogical, um, until eventually, um, on a different post, completely unrelated, he decided to try to taunt me into a debate. Nick Irwin at the uh, Enemy of the State's Dank Podstash recently put out the call for people interested in debates, either watching them or being a participant. And so I said, yeah, I'd be interested to be a participant. And I expected people who were like serious intellectuals, trademark, to <laughs> come in and see if they could take a crack at me. Um, and, and admittedly, like, this situation didn't turn out poorly, I don't think, but Cody decided to come on and demand that I debate him on any subject. And he wouldn't articulate the subject because, like I said, he can't prove me wrong on any given subject. And <laughs> let me just say, uh, if you have a problem with me and you can't articulate why you have a problem with me, I probably won't give a fuck what your problem is. Um, if, if you can't tell me why I'm wrong and remain logical and consistent, I really don't care. Um, but he kept on, you know, demanding a debate, and I kept on telling Nick he's an unrigorous, like... Basically, he, he, he doesn't have any merit to his arguments, and that's why he's coming on here and not giving a subject he disagrees with me on. So he scrubs through my timeline and says, it's hard to find things to disagree with you on. Um, and then he eventually stumbles upon... Um, violent revolution versus peaceful. So he eventually settles on that and then demands that be the debate topic. And, you know, whatever. I didn't want to debate him because I didn't think he'd be, like, honest. I thought he'd use it as an opportunity to be, you know, bad faith argue or make a bunch of personal attacks. And to be fair, there were a fair share of those in the thing. Um, but the debate happened yesterday. Uh, yesterday evening, and the recording was posted today. So, I have now uh, the opening statements from that debate, and I want you all to check out the opening statements, see what you think of them, but then if you like what you're hearing and you want to hear more, and maybe tell people who you thought won the full debate, feel free to head over to the link in the description um, to get access to the Enemy of the State's Dank Podstash YouTube channel. Feel free to subscribe. Uh, he's great people and, uh, generally speaking, a very good interviewer, so he definitely deserves your sub. Um, but with all that being said, let's slam into this fucking shit show and, uh, and, and show you how it started, because it pretty much sets the entire tone for the rest of the debate. So... With all that being said, all right, welcome to the first and what I hope will be a monthly series of debates on Enemy of the State's Dank Podstash. Tonight, I'm joined by Jeremy Harding and Cody Ranting, both of Facebook and other fame, and we're going to be dis you know, discovering uh, more about the topic, more about the divide between violent revolution and peaceful revolution. Jeremy's going to be representing Violent Revolution, Cody, Peaceful Revolution. So, without any further ado, let's jump into opening statements. Uh, I'm going to pass it over to Jeremy to go ahead and go first. Oh, I'm fine with being black. Cody can go first. Okay. <laughs> we can pass it, too. Did <laughs> you write that one down? Or... <laughs> okay. All right. Um, my opening statement. I'm just want to be as clear as possible. I know I'm I'm reading off of a screen here. It's pretty obvious. I just wrote some notes down. But uh, uh, the discussion, as far as I see it, 
is is about the need for violence and revolution versus the lack of that need. Uh, the merits of peaceful revolution speak for themselves on paper in that they serve to reduce the bloodshed, promises of civil war to come. And uh, basically its biggest scrutiny is just the practicality and its applications in, in a world where for the most part, most people believe that might makes right that uh, a violent revolution would be necessary. And I believe this is not necessary for political change as I can easily demonstrate. And even as vast as something as, as being proposed here, you know, the complete dismantle of the government, you know, or even uh, going from a, a violent regime to a more, you know, will of the people sort of thing. Uh, it has been shown throughout history to be viable. And in my opinion, not only viable, but the more plausible for longevity. If we are to expect any longevity from a massive cultural shift, such as a revolution, the philosophy must follow that we will not tolerate unwarranted violence, knee-jerk reactionaries, or other authoritarians that just wish someone would, but that we understand the demand for government and why it exists in the first place and use markets as mechanisms of freedom to prove otherwise and show that our peace will be achieved through non-regrettable means. Um, it always seems to be the people and the hope of the people that the need for government uh, the people that need government the least will use violence the least. And its practicality only ever comes into question when we don't understand how to begin this transition from these atrocities we observe daily to a society fully privatized in the sense of the wishes of the people entrenched in the structures of social order have no weight on our choices any longer. And that the only way this can happen is through understanding the mechanism at which they enslave us all, and that is economics. I believe that understanding econ is paramount to revolution, it's staying power, and is the central pivoting point that decides a successful revolution versus the enriched dissent as it dictates the critical mass enjoys this knowledge, doesn't reject the logic, and dictates the conversation therein. The only thing that changed my already emboldened view on politics was an appeal to free will and the power of economic revolt versus simply throwing Molotov cocktails or blowing up buildings or you know, any sort of uh, violent reaction towards the obvious atrocities the government commits. And that each day is a new day that could bring us a change we all hope to see in the news. You know, Bitcoin used as official currency of the Western Hemisphere, you know, that would be something we can only dream of. Bitcoin threatens our illusions of government, any, more, more so than any threat of physical violence. And the critical mass we speak of is not some already enlightened anarchist that understands the threat that the Federal Reserve poses. These are brainwashed people that we are trying to convert or rather, you know, omit these truths, you know, or I mean, uh, admit these truths that are obvious to some of us and uh, not so obvious to others. But that these people come from a society that has already given them permission to steal and harm you. And if you don't follow whatever arbitrary things they say or do politically, you know, they, they're, they're pointing a gun at your face. And violence is a tool of the state. And it's their best tool and their only real tool. And, you know, I wasn't swayed by, you know, I, I, was, I was an avid socialist, pretty much Democrat, from the moment I even understood political atmosphere. And, um, you know, I wasn't swayed by somebody yelling at me on the internet. I wasn't I wasn't even tempted or even slighted in any direction by anything I thought, you know, was a viable opinion on something. It was, it was, it was me watching Milton Friedman smile as he destroyed Donald Rumsfeld in his show Free to Choose. It was it, those, those types of people, the people who just smile and nod and they know because they don't, you know, it's like, it's like when people go around claiming this or that, and, oh, I'm this, I'm that, and I'm an anarchist and I'm blah, blah, blah. Not that I'm pointing any fingers, obviously it doesn't pertain to everybody, but people can go around and say a lot of things, but it's it's their ability to smile and nod and move forward and 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 that sort of thing that makes that that obviously changed my mind. And I think that is a very pivotal thing as far as um, a peaceful revolution being a viable option is that mentality, you know, that way of getting people to see something that is beautiful and and 
luxurious in its in its truth giving properties. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, that's just yeah, all I got there. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. All right, Jeremy, five minutes to you for your opening statement. <clears throat> Before this debate proceeds, I want to make it clear that I don't oppose pacifists, nor do I hold their stance against them, especially if they're willing to aid the rebellion. An anarchist pacifist I know made a great point about this, saying that not everyone is going to be on the front lines in a truly organic rebellion, and some people will be seamstresses, not soldiers. I was already asked if there was a way to do both or balance them together, is there middle ground between the two, or does it have to be one or the other? Unequivocally, yes, there must be middle ground. There is no successful 100% violent revolution, just as there is no successful 100% peaceful revolution. And any good revolutionary must first safeguard their soul from being robbed by the fight. As V from V for Vendetta put it, a revolution without dancing is a revolution not worth having. But this is precisely the issue with many people opposed to violent revolution. They want a revolution entirely comprised of dancing. Bedazzled by the spectacle of protests and social reform, they want to march their way to peace. In the face of any great historical tyranny, however, this approach is both weak and willed and impotent, as it allows not for the evils of man and what grotesque barbarity they will enact upon one another in the name of an external entity. Thus, their marches for peace are met with the marches of jackboots in the streets, and they're written in history books as bitter losers in the ever forward churn of the state machine of oppression. We still sing four dead in Ohio and people are righteously furious to this day. Who faced justice? Nobody. Remember the massacre at Tiananmen Square and as Skinny pu Puppy put it succinctly, Changing guns for brooms, the guards chained to cleanup crews. The scene was mopped, and few images remain, and now the lone man carrying groceries is long gone, and so are a laundry list of further Chinese freedoms gone to the wind. Are the students and citizens of Hong Kong in the moral wrong for fighting back? They're using violent means, so in the eyes of my opponent, they are. How about the founders of the U.S. protesting abuses and usurpations with the force of arms? Are they villains in that right concurrently? Or the black men who bitterly clung to their weapons as a symbol of freedom, are they wrong? Should they not have resisted the state's advancement upon them? Huey Newton once said any unarmed people are slaves or subject to slavery at any given point. People like my opponent would likely side against that notion as they only appreciate the sentiment of don't tread on me if the snake is defanged. As to the efficaciousness of violent revolution, many have burdened its advocates with proof they work. Many more have claimed the disproportionality of force between the state and the people is too great, that we've already exhausted violence as an option and peace is the only res remaining front. Well, to that, I implore your eyes to the lessons learned in Vietnam, where insurgents successfully resisted a truly evil and murderous campaign of invasion, aggression, and largely unrivaled casualties by cunning, wit, and the dirty fighting tactics of yore. Tactics such as guerrilla warfare proposed as far back as the days of Sun Tzu and employed by the fighters in Afghanistan to this day. I wonder how the U.S. hasn't won the war they claim is against terror. Could it be that a small band of fighters can still be effective? Isn't that why the CIA trained Mujahideen to fight Russia instead of going directly to war? Isn't that why the same CIA required a whole new branch of intelligence that is counterintelligence in order to destroy movements such as these? The rote pacifists may be good at winning public support, but to what end? Seems there are more laws than ever, more cops than ever, and a global super state that makes one suffered previously look libertarian by comparison. That's why Huey also said, sometimes if you want to get rid of the gun, you have to pick the gun up. It's why many racist politicians and tyrants of yore demand disarmament. I go by two axioms. That which scares people toward legislation is likely effective at opposing them. And if peaceful resistance would put a wrench in the gears of this ever advancing behemoth, it too would be illegal. The state will not go quietly, and the revolution will not be televised. It's amusing to me that violent self-defense by an individual for an individual is normally seen as acceptable, 
while the state's violence must be endured with a stiff back war hardened by the crack of the whip along long formed calluses. I argue in the face of violence, violent self-defense is not only acceptable, but necessary. Be warned against the civil disobedience pushed by people like my opponent, because it often leads to the sedentary. And when boots are at your door, no amount of peace will keep you safe, as evidenced by all the civilians murdered both here and abroad to no punishment of the officials responsible and usually to someone's profit. Violence may not be their bag, but if we're to succeed, someone must carry the satchel. Thank you. Fiery. Excellent. Love it, guys. That's great. So, <laughs> opening statements completed. There was a story told a thousand years ago That the oppressed will break the shackles that take control The city's gonna burn, the world is gonna turn You read about it all the time